Speaking of legacies, uh, Madam Vice President, uh, gun violence causes trauma and deeply impacts our mental health, and especially true for young folks who are going through active shooter drills, that are losing their friends and families at such a young age. Uh, and you have spent your career, I would argue, most of your life working on this issue. Um, as district attorney, 20 years of pouring into efforts to be smart about how we prevent violence and really elevating the national model for how we deal with stress and trauma um, amongst our youth. Um, I also just want to mention, as California Attorney General, you created the Bureau of Children's Justice to shape the state's response to the crisis of childhood exposure to trauma. And as the Vice President, you continue to emphasize the importance of addressing the trauma that too many of, have, of us have faced uh, with gun violence. And so I uh, would love for you to talk a little bit more about how you've been fighting to prioritize mental health and really resources and support to help those who have been impacted by trauma. Mm -hmm. Well, gun violence in the neighborhood, in the community, without any question results in trauma. And you it, just think about trauma as being an invisible wound, but a wound nonetheless. And like any wound, if it does not heal in a healthy way, it will continue to be a problem. Um, I will say that there are many sources of trauma. Poverty is trauma-inducing. When you start compounding sources of trauma, then you can just imagine how the trauma is even more severe. So let's speak truth about that as well. But, you know, on the issue of, of what I've seen in particular about the trauma that, that comes from exposure to violence, you know, um, some people will simplify the point of, of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. And, and one of the ways that I've heard it simplified, but it makes sense, is um, imagine every day you're walking across a very busy street. And out of nowhere, some, a Mack truck comes barreling down. Without reflection, you'll, you'll produce what's called a, a cortisol. You, your body will, will absolutely just react without reflection and you'll jump back. But if every day at different points in time that, that Mack truck comes, you're gonna overproduce that thing. To the, that, that is the thing that your body is designed to do to help you deal with stress. But when you overproduce it, one day, as this, this example goes, you're walking across the street, you look up, you see that Mack truck coming, and you keep walking. Because you've so overproduced this thing that it makes you numb. It's really important to understand that that is one of the symptoms of exposure to trauma-inducing things because, you know, when we talk about how especially our young people are misdiagnosed, when people will look at our young people and say, oh, they don't have any emotion or feelings, that response to this thing doesn't seem like a healthy response. Well, when people have been overexposed to trauma-inducing events, that's physiologically what happens. So we have to also elevate the conversation about what trauma looks like and the effects, what the effects of trauma look like. It includes that a young person, or any, of any age, by the way, will have trouble sleeping at night, will have depression, will have flashbacks. If they're in class, will act out and then get labeled the bad kid which just produces a whole other cycle of then getting, right, put on detention, getting kicked out of school. So this issue of early diagnosis and treatment of trauma has profound impacts on everyone from our youngest to of any age. And part of then the work that, that, that Quavo, you've been doing with the foundation, what we've been doing is to elevate the importance of dealing with mental health. And it's something that all communities need to address, but we in particular have to remind people, when we talk about healthcare, for too long people have acted as though the body starts from the neck down. Well, what about the healthcare we need from the neck up? That's healthcare. 
And so mental health care is important, but we got to put the resources into it. And the thing that we know is we need to have culturally competent mental health care providers. <laughs> you mentioned, Greg, I did the college tour last fall. And I went to a number of schools, including our HBCUs, of course, and I would, I would challenge the young people. You know, like there was back in the day, challenging people to go into public service. I'm challenging our young leaders. Think about a calling for yourself in the profession of mental health. Whether it be from being a therapist to, to being, you know, going to medical school. But we need more people doing this stuff. And, and the one thing that I find with our younger leaders is they're more willing to talk about mental health than people of older generations. And I think I see that as a sign of opportunity. But to meet them where they are, where they are and what they're asking for, we need more resources going into the treatment. And, um, and I think we can, we can get there. And we've already, for the work that we've done, over 300 mental health counselors in the public schools of Georgia as a result of the work the president and I have done. And, and I will add one more thing. Please pass the word. There's a crisis line that we've set up, 988. And here's the thing to let people know about that. You can be anonymous. You can text it. You can call it. You can have a conversation. Sometimes it's just about creating safe places for people to talk, just to be able to talk. And so 988 is something that we should get the word out where it's anonymous. You can just call and talk with somebody about how you are feeling in a safe place. Thank you.